Oh, yeah. Hey, good morning. Uh, so we are really lucky to have the speaker here. He was one of the original people in mapping the genome, right? Sort of, yeah, I mean, this is big time. Um, anyway, and he really, I mean, what he knows in science would confuse all of us if we had to listen to him. I mean, he, you know, where his brain normally works is, I can't go there. <laughs> Anyway, uh, but one of the things he really loves to do is to translate all those high scientific things into words that we can understand, which I think is, I, I think that's fabulous. Anyway, so I now give you Dennis Strena. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, yes, I'd like, if this is too loud, is this okay? All right. I have a bad habit of shouting at my audience. Um, uh, so I'd like to thank the Oakmont Symposium, not only for the invitation to come here and speak today, uh, but also for keeping this whole enterprise going, especially during the last uh, couple of challenging years. Okay, uh, so today we're going to talk about speech and speech disorders. Um, but first, uh, next slide, please. Um, these things now all begin with your disclosures. All speakers now have to give their disclosures. So this is my one and only disclosure at this point. Uh, I serve, I have the privilege of serving uh, on the board of directors of a very fine organization known as the Stuttering Foundation of America. Um, they don't pay me anything. Uh, um, if any of you have grandchildren who develop a stutter and you or their parents are worried about it, contact this organization. Everything they do is pretty much free uh, and they're extremely uh, uh, competent and uh, extremely helpful organization. Okay, next slide. Okay, so uh, I wanna talk a little bit uh, about my, uh, my professional background um, and show you actually where this was done. Uh, so this was done at um, the National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders. It's one of the 21 institutes that make up the National Institutes of Health, the NIH. We're part of the United States Department of Health and Human Services, okay? Um, the main campus for the NIH is located in Bethesda, Maryland, which is a suburb of Washington, DC. Uh, and my lab uh, where we did all this was in something called the Porter Neuroscience Research Center, which is this white building right here in the corner. Um, is we're right next door to the Vaccine Research Center, which is this other white building. If you got a COVID vaccination, much of the technology that went into that vaccine came from this building right here. Uh, this giant thing sometimes claimed, I don't know, maybe it's an urban legend, sometimes claimed to be the world's largest red brick building is the NIH Clinical Center. It's the largest hospital devoted purely to research, uh, medical research in the world. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> Next slide. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to first talk a little bit about communication and communication disorders. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about genetics and sort of how you use genetics to sort of figure things out. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about uh, what we learned about a particularly common speech disorder. Okay. So uh, what about communication? What we call auditory communication, things we can hear. Um, what made humans um, take control of this planet? Why are humans on top? I think most people would say it's because humans are smarter than all the other animals. Um, and that's true. Um, there's some pretty smart animals, uh, I should say. Uh, there's a lot of stories about how amazingly smart some animals can be. But um, really, in addition to just intelligence, I mean, the smartest person in the world working by themselves could not build the interstate highway system, right? What, what has really allowed humans to dominate this planet has been their ability to communicate and undertake very large enterprises that really can exert enormous control over our environment and the planet and our lives. Uh, so, you know, speech disorders sound, uh, you know, it's easy to think of them as trivial. Nobody dies of a speech disorder, right? It's not like cancer, right? Um, but you know, the people who have them, 
uh, feel their lives have been devastated. Uh, and that just reinforces a, a, an easily forgotten fact, which is that it's communication that really underlies a lot of human existence, all right, and what we can do in this world. Uh, now, uh, there are two kinds, generally speaking, there are two kinds of communication disorders, speech disorders. There are receptive disorders, people who have trouble understanding speech, okay, getting speech from others. Uh, and then there are expressive disorders. Expressive disorders are disorders in the production of speech, okay, your ability to express yourself. Uh, receptive disorders are mostly deafness. Uh, deafness is very common, um, uh, and a lot of it happens a lot of that happens to be genetic, uh, but um, we work on, I work on expressive disorders and uh, by far the most common expressive speech disorder is this thing called stuttering. So what is stuttering? St in st uh, stuttering, um, in stuttering people know exactly what they want to say, but they just can't say it, at least at the rate they would like. Uh, it's characterized by things like uh, repetitions, I, 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 I went to the store. Uh, prolongations, I w w w w went to the store. Uh, and silent interruptions, I went to the store, okay? Um, it is, so what, when I st first started learning about this disorder, I was struck by what's not wrong with the speech of these people, okay? they don't have problems with what's called word finding or memory. They, they know the word. Um, they don't have problems with grammar. They don't have problems with syntax. That is how words are put together to make sense of things. Uh, they don't have articulation disorders. They don't have a lisp or something like that. Um, they know exactly what they wanna say. They just can't say it at the rate they would like. The disease typically arises in little kids, um, like age three or something like that. Um, and fortunately, in most of those kids, it resolves either just spontaneously by itself or um, with the help of a little speech therapy. Uh, for about a, a fifth or a quarter, uh, it does not resolve. And those people are left with a condition known as persistent stuttering, and it's lifelong. Uh, people sometimes uh, talk about the current president of the United States as being a little slow. Well, he stutters, and those are his blocks. Sometimes you listen to him. If, you, if you're really good at listening to people who stutter and sort of can kind of get it, um, he, he just has blocks. And, he, he, um, and that some people consider the block to be the fundamental problem in stuttering. Uh, and the other stuff, the repetitions and the prolongations are just attempts to get around the block, all right? Okay, so next slide, please. All right, so what causes this disorder? It's been a long list, okay? Uh, the uh, top of the list, the ever popular bad parenting, okay? And in particular, overly strict toilet training. This has been a very popular explanation for years, okay? Uh, anxiety causes stuttering. It is true that you can take a person with a very mild stutter and turn it into a very severe stutter by just, I don't know, asking them to give a speech in front of 500 people. <laughs> a lot of people who stutter don't stutter unless they're on the telephone, interestingly enough, because they can't use body language on the phone, you know, so they get on the phone and all of a sudden you get this stutter. Um, so anxiety makes stuttering worse, but it's clear that it doesn't cause stuttering. Uh, there's plenty of anxiety in the world in people who don't stutter. Um, but the, the relationship between anxiety and what we call speech fluency, that is how, how smoothly you speak, uh, is not well understood. And I think one of the remaining most interesting puzzles about the disorder. Uh, auditory feedback. We all hear our own speech, okay? Um, and maybe something's wrong with the way we hear our speech uh, and that that's what causes this disruption in the flow of what we say, okay? Uh, and there is some data to back this up, um, but I'll just leave it at that. Another popular one 
is communication between the two halves of the brain. Our brain has a left side and a right side. Um, speech is very heavily a left side process. There is an area of the brain uh, up here uh, called Broca's area. It's named after a famous French neurologist, Paul Broca. And Paul Broca was presented with a patient in 1879 or something um, who had a stroke, a mild stroke, and he lost the ability to speak. And nothing else was wrong with this person, nothing. So he kept in touch with this patient who was elderly and at the, got permission to do an autopsy. And after death, he found that this person had had a stroke, a focal stroke, just up here in this region, which has a lot to do with speech in now called Broca's area. Okay, um, but not everything is on the left side of speech. A lot of things we need to do in speech are done on the right side. So there has to be a lot of quick communication. And speech is the fastest things humans do. It's a millisecond, one thousandth of a second. Is, has to, the timing has to be that good to make intelligible speech sounds. So that's faster than, um, you know, the greatest fastball pitcher <laughs> in the history of Major League Baseball. It's an extremely fast function. And so that communication has to happen very easily. Uh, basal ganglia, there's a region of your brain. It's down deep. Um, it's underneath what you can see. You see a picture of a brain and it looks like these worms, you know, that's your cortex. Um, and that's all the higher functions. The, the, beneath that, which you, you can't really see very easily, is all the low primitive functions. Emotion and things like that um, are all down in the, controlled by the basal ganglia. And a lot of people said that's the part of the brain where the problem has to be for a variety of scientific reasons. And then finally, just a plain old motor deficit, okay? Uh, speech involves movement, right? A special kind of movement, a very fast and well-controlled movement, but it's, it's motion. Um, hey, maybe it's just a special form of Parkinson's disease. That's a motor disorder, right? Um, there are lots of uh, damage to the cerebellum, which is this part of the brain in the back. People have a stroke or, or they sustain an injury to the cerebellum. They'll, they'll reach for something and, and they'll miss it. They, they can't, people with cerebellar problems, they can't pick up this glass of water because they, they just miss and it's required for motor control. Well, maybe that's a problem. It's, it's just back here. So these are, the, these are the popular theories. Okay, next slide. Uh, so much for speech. Uh, we can talk more about speech later if anyone has any questions. Um, genetics. Uh, what is genetics? Well, my favorite definition of genetics is that it's the study of variation, it's the study of differences between people, between any two organisms. Uh, it uh, involves our genes. So what are genes? Genes are the individual units that code for specific products, specific gene products, okay? Uh, so together, these products comprise the structures and functions of the body, okay? So um, there are 21,000 different genes in the human genome. Uh, I, can't, I can't resist a story. Uh, when they were starting to sequence the human genome, there was a, a, a contest, a pool called Gene Sweep. And it cost, at the beginning, it cost a dollar to enter. And the, the, what you guessed at was the, how many genes are going to be in the human genome? How many genes do we have as humans? Um, and uh, I guess 50,001, that's what I, that was my guess. Uh, as the genome started to be sequenced and then the cost of entering got higher and higher because then it cost $5 to enter and then it cost $10 to enter. At the end of the contest, and this was all a bunch of scientists, right? The, those, were the, those were the competitors, the scientists. Uh, every single guess was too high. Every single guess. Nobody guessed 21,000 or even close. Um, so, um, so, I, so how can you get something as complicated as a human with the same number of genes as a fruit fly? And the reason, there are complicated reasons and we could talk about that later if you want, but it turns out human genes are organized and turned on and turned off in very complicated ways that other organisms don't do. Okay. 
Um, these genes reside in structures inside the cell called chromosomes. Uh, they're named because chroma, colored, soma, body. Chromosome, they're colored bodies. When people started, they got, first got good microscopes and could look at cells, they would stain them with different things to try and light up different stuff that's inside the cells. And they saw these colored things and they called them chromosomes. Um, and that's where the genes are. Okay, next slide. Um, now, I'm going to just say that there is a disease that is caused by a mistake in any one of those 21,000 genes. Okay, so um, hemophilia, the bleeding disease, is caused by a gene uh, called factor eight. Um, uh, any, any gene. Any gene has a, a disease associated with it. Now, some of those diseases are so severe that they're incompatible with life. And so the person who has that disease never gets born, okay? Um, but there's this huge array of genetic diseases for uh, each of the genes in the human genome, okay? And the 1990s, um, and early 2000s was sort of the golden era as people began to get the sequence of the human genome, they could better and better assign what disease was caused by which gene. And so there was this huge, as I say, golden age of figuring out what gene caused all of these rare genetic diseases, cystic fibrosis and polycystic kidney disease and hemophilia and uh, muscular dystrophy and you name it, um, there was a period of time when the causative gene was discovered and it was extremely enlightening um, in almost every case. So, um, but what about the rest of the disorders? I mean, all these disorders I've been talking about are rare disorders. I mean, I personally, I don't know anybody with hemophilia, but it's fairly well known. Cystic fibrosis. I do know, I think, somebody with cystic fibrosis, but these are rare disorders. What about the common diseases? Well, these things clearly have genetic inputs. They're not a simple disease, genetic disease, because they come from a combination of genetic predisposition and environment, okay? These are so-called complex disorders, and they're complex because they're not purely genes. Okay, so here's some examples. Uh, like I say, they're caused by a combination of genetic and non-genetic factors. They include most major classes of medical disorders. So cardiovascular disease, psychiatric disease, metabolic disorders, obesity, diabetes, osteoporosis, you name it, all of them have a strong genetic contribution. But there's no one single gene that causes heart disease. It's not like hemophilia. It's not like cystic fibrosis, right? It's, you get heart disease from genetic predisposition plus how many bacon double cheeseburgers you eat, right? <laughs> um, environment. Okay, so among these complex disorders is stuttering. Stuttering is not a simply inherited disease. It doesn't follow the rules for the, of inheritance for these simple medical genetic disorders. Most of these disorders have very specific patterns of occurrence in families. You can trace them very easily. Complex traits, they cluster in families and that's all you got. You know, it just, they don't follow any rules. They don't sort of make sense in, in that respect. So it, the great triumphs of finding rare medical genetic, what we call single gene disorders, those methods didn't work for all the complex diseases. Uh, all of us who did the things for the rare medical genetic disorders, we all just pivoted and started working on, you know, obesity, diabetes, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, osteoporosis, right? And we all promptly went into the swamp, okay? So it took about 15 years to begin to dig ourselves out of the swamp, but uh, we've been able to do it with a variety of mostly new technology, very high powered technology. A lot of DNA sequencing uh, and a lot of very large scale ways of measuring differences in DNA between people, because that's what genetics is. It's the study of variation. 
And what geneticists do is they figure out how variation in your DNA, your genes, right, is connected to differences in your health, your height, your skin color, your eye color, your weight, your bone mass density, you name it, right? All right, uh, next slide, please. All right, why are genetic approaches so powerful? Well, they're capable of finding the genes that cause any inherited disorder. Simple medical genetic disorders, complex disorders. If it's genetics, we can find the genes, okay? It's an ideal approach for inherited disorders that are difficult to study in other ways. Speech disorders are very difficult to study in other ways. Um, there's no biochemistry. There's no pathology. There's no physiology. These are disorders of things going on inside the brain. There's no easy way to look in there at the level we would need to look. Um, however, genetics can just circumvent all these problems and get us right to the cause of the disorder. If it's genetic, we can find that gene and then we know that cause, okay? So once we have the genes, we can see what the gene codes for, what its function is, both normally and in people who, in this case, stutter, all right? That was the goal. We're gonna go find genes that cause this common speech disorder because all the other, there are plenty of good possible explanations, but we had no other way of distinguishing which one of those many possible causes was actually true and which ones were not true. Okay, next slide, please. All right, genetic factor in stuttering. Uh, inherited, inherited disorders tend to cluster in families. Uh, I'll just tell you, uh, there's strong familial, what we call familial aggregation for stuttering. That means it clusters in families, all right? Uh, my uncle stuttered. Uh, until he got to college. My elder brother stuttered actually a little bit all his life. Uh, our twin boys both stuttered, but they completely recovered. Uh, it clusters in families. Lots of things cluster in families. Religion clusters in families, right? The ability to speak French in the United States clusters very strongly in families. The question is, um, is this nature or is this nurture? Is this genetic or is this somehow environment, family environment? You know, bad parenting counts as environment, right? Um, so geneticists have figured out a way to answer this question uh, and uh, a couple of ways. And one of the best are twin studies. Another good way is adoption studies. Uh, and we can go over how these studies are done. They're, they're fun uh, to do these studies. I did a lot of work. Um, at, in Twinsburg, Ohio, which is a suburb of Cleveland. And every summer, first weekend in August, they hold the world's largest festival of twins. Uh, thousands of twin pairs show up and it's a lot of fun. Uh, but one thing they have is a research tent uh, and you can go and do research on twins and answer how much is nature and how much is nurture for any trait, any disorder, anything you're interested in, you can go do those kind of studies at Twinsburg on the first weekend in August every year. Um, so to just cut to the chase here, uh, twin studies and adoption studies telling, tell us that stuttering is mostly genetic, which was a huge surprise initially to the speech language pathology community, most speech and educators, most Great, you know, elementary school teachers and speech language pathologists thought the stuttering was caused by the environment in the home, something like that. That's was the, the common thinking. Turns out it's not. It's mostly about 85% genetic. Okay, next slide. Okay, so how are we going to find these genes? Well, I told you for complex traits, the entire field of us gene finders. We moved, you know, we just pivoted from working on rare medical genetic disorders to complex traits like stuttering, right? And went into the swamp. Um, so uh, that's what happened in the first studies of stuttering. Uh, we all who were working on this in stuttering just went into the swamp. So uh, in our lab, we decided, um, look, we know it's genes. I mean, there are nine independent twin studies. You know, these, these 
in different languages on different continents using different statistical data analysis methods. They all say stuttering is genetic. So how are we going to find these genes? Well, we said, let's go look for special families, big, huge families with many, 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 many cases of stuttering. Uh, and in those cases, there's some gene being passed down through that family uh, that has a big effect, right? It, whatever it is, environment isn't having much to do with it. In this case, we're going to go look for genes, what we say, genes of large effect. Uh, and to do that, you need these great big families. Uh, next slide. Here's one. <laughs> so I'm going to make you all human geneticists. This is a pedigree, OK? Uh, the circles are the girls, and the squares are the boys, all right? Uh, so when um, there's a mating between a boy, in this case, an affected boy and an affected girl, they have three children. The eldest is a boy. The middle child is a girl. The, middle, the youngest is a girl. And all five of them stutter. Um, now, there's something odd about this pedigree, aside from the fact that it's enormous. It's a, a joke in science. Um, scientists say, in their, they write these papers, right? And they publish them in journals. Typical results are shown. Translation, the best results are shown. <laughs> so this is the best family we found. Um, in Pakistan, we went to Pakistan, um, where everyone marries their cousin and have for at least a thousand years. So when, when the, the mother and the father are related in these sort of charts, they get a double line. See this double line here? There's double line here and here. He, to give you an idea of how much cousin marriage there is in this particular society, here are two boys and a girl that married two girls and a boy that are offspring of their first cousin. Okay, so these people are first cousins to these people. So there is an enormous amount of, it's called consanguinity, but you can think of it as inbreeding in these families. And as another thing you can see is there is an enormous number of people in this family who stutter. Um, so you can use this kind of family, and in fact, you can make traction. And we discovered in this, starting with this family, but moving on to many others, that there's a gene on chromosome number 12 that causes stuttering. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the gene in this family uh, is called, I won't bore you, uh, it's called GNPTAB. Uh, and how did we know this was the causative gene? Oh, yeah, of course. We sequenced all of them. We sequenced every gene, uh, and we found a mutation in this gene and in no other gene, right? in which uh, the, the people who stutter in that family had it, and the people who did not stutter in that family didn't have it, okay? Because the genes are naturally assorted as they get passed on from, from parent to offspring. So that way we knew we had it, but there was more. We looked for um, mutations in this gene in not only in other families of many people who stutter, but just unrelated single people who stutter. Forget family, just, just individuals. And 21% of them had a mutation in this gene. Okay, so we, you know, we got a hit. <laughs> uh, you know, the, you send out a spread of torpedoes and this one hit the battleship. Um, it was a big deal. Um, turns out what this gene does, and we'll get to that in a second, um, it does it in conjunction with a couple of other genes, a closely related gene called GNPTG and another one called NAGPA. And so we just looked in those genes now in people who stutter. And right away, we found, began to find mutations in people who stutter, and not in people who don't stutter, not in normally fluent people. OK. Um, so it's a, it was a common mistake. I, I can't resist repeating myself. Um, we found mutations in these genes in a people. This does not explain stuttering in Pakistan. We found mutations in that gene in people in Asia South Asia, in people in East Asia, in people in Europe, in people in Africa, in people in South America, and people in North America. The only place we didn't find people with mutations who stutter with mutations in that gene, Antarctica. Well, the question is, did you have to sell the Subaru? Okay. Um, and then we found some more genes. Next slide, please. This was a wild one. 
I, I, I'm not going to lead you through how we found this family, but it's a remarkable family in Cameroon. Here's Cameroon. The different branches of the family live where the, these where these dots are. Um, it's an uh, extremely uh, high functioning family. The person who uh, the initial contact in this family for me uh, was an attorney. His elder brother is superintendent of schools. And uh, I was telling people at the NIH, I found this family in Africa and Francis Collins. I don't know if any of you have heard of Francis Collins, the head of the NIH. Yeah, I mean, oftentimes when Tony Fauci would be standing next to Donald Trump, you know, it was Francis who was the guy behind him, wisely not saying anything. Uh, uh, in any case, Francis, I told Francis about this, and he said, oh, just go. You know, there's a lot of people in this family, just go. I said, Francis, I'm not only am I not a neurologist, I'm not, or a psychiatrist, I'm not a physician. He said, just go. He said, if there's something else wrong with these people, you'll be able to see it if you just go see. And so I, I did. I went there. I, I went there a lot. Uh, it's a great place, a very beautiful place. Um, um, and sure enough, uh, here were all these high-functioning people. And the only thing wrong with them was they had this nasty stutter. Uh, next slide. Uh, the, the patriarch of the family was a chief. He had three wives. So here is our chief. His little line drawn through him because he's no longer alive. And here are his one, two, three wives. And he had kids, total of 22 kids. This wife had a brother who stuttered. As far as we know, the chief himself never stuttered. People say he didn't stutter, but we're not so sure. He's been dead for a while. But you see, they all had all these kids. Here, this, this little arrow is, this is what we call the pro band. Um, he's the guy who the, we got into the family. He's the guy who, who contacted me and said, my family stutters. Um, he's from Cameroon. This is the attorney. Um, but not only did all his kids and many of his grandchildren stutter, but it, there, look, there's all these nieces, nephews, cousins, over here, and they also stuttered. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. We found causative gene here. It's called AP4E1. I won't bore you with the details, but a mutation in this gene found in affected members of the Cameroonian family, was found in the affected members of the family, and also in many unrelated individuals who study stutter worldwide. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm gonna tell you in a second what all these genes do, but I will just tell you that the product of this gene People, it was very um, interesting gene, what it did, but they didn't know what it acted on. They knew what its function was, uh, uh, but they didn't know what the target of that function was. Um, so the guy who helped me do this, just it, turns, it was an amazing stroke of luck. The guy who discovered this, this thing was, had the office directly up above mine at the NIH in the Neuroscience Center. It was like, <laughs> what are the chances of that? 21,000 genes, and this one is his gene, you know? Uh, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah. So his guy came down to me about three weeks later, and he said, do you know that, that, that this gene here recognizes, we found it recognizes another product of a different, uh, one more gene. And what is it? It interacts with the product of this thing. And if you can go back one more, uh, two more slides. Uh, yes. It was like deja vu all over again, to quote Yogi Berra. Um, it's like, wait, out of all the 21,000 genes, this is what it acts on? This one? Well, we already knew that one was a stuttering gene. So it was like, woohoo. This is, you know, this is all of a sudden, this is, this is looking familiar. So if you could just go ahead, one, two, three, uh, and one more. So now, what do these things do? Uh, that's the thing about genetics. It will get you to a gene like you never expected. It's like, what the heck? How did, what does this have to do with it? They're often a surprise. There's no obvious connection between that gene and the disease that you're, stuttering, that you're studying that you would have guessed. So this is the power of genetics, right? So next slide, please. Uh, so what these things do is they, um, they encode things that move molecules around inside the cell. 
intracellular, inside the cell, trafficking. Uh, this is what the Nobel Prize was awarded for um, 10 years ago. So Randy Sheckman at Berkeley, um, Jim Rothman, who uh, was at Princeton, I think at the time, and Thomas Sudhoff, who was at Stanford, won the Nobel Prize for discovering this thing. It's a very fundamental mechanism. All cells have it. Uh, and they cells, you know, they got to get things. They take things in here, but they got to use them over there. And they once they make something, they've got to put it over here. So it's a very fundamental way of uh, life. Very fundamental process in all living systems is moving things around inside the cell. So um, turns out deficits in this process um, are, are an emerging concept in neurological disorders. They started out as being discovered for extremely rare medical genetic disorders, things I had never heard of. Perry syndrome, hermansky pudlak syndrome, Neiman-Pick type C. It's like 20 people in the world have this disease, but they found the causative gene and it was some trafficking thing. It's like, what's going on? Um, so it turns out nerve cells are these long cells. Most cells are very, very small, but our nerve cells can actually be up to several feet in length. Our motor neurons coming out from our spine. It, a typical neuron nerve cell in the brain is a couple inches long. So these are very, very, very long cells. And they have very severe demands for getting things from one end to the other. So all trafficking deficits to date are neurologic diseases. They're not liver diseases. They're not heart diseases. They're not bone diseases. They're like brain diseases. So it turns out Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, all probably are fundamentally trafficking deficits. Probably, it looks like. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this I've already told you. Mutations in these genes are found in people who stutter everywhere. And we now have about 25% of stuttering cases kind of accounted for by the genes we've found so far. Um, next slide. Uh, now, what, how are you going to figure out how this causes stuttering? I mean, so how does moving things around inside the cell cause I w w w w w went to the store? It's like, well, that's a pretty big jump. So what we need is an animal model. And there's only one problem with that. Animals don't talk. <laughs> Uh, however, mice, uh, which are the standard laboratory animal, uh, have very rich vocal communication. Most of it is ultrasonic. It's too high for us to hear. Um, so it's, it hasn't been very well characterized. It wasn't even known to exist until fairly recently. Uh, interesting side fact. Mice, the frequency, how high the sound is in mouse communication starts is, is 20,000 it's 20,000 cycles per second and goes up to about 110. It starts where cat hearing ends. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can do a lot of things with mice. Um, now, of course, most, most vocalization is not a model for human speech. Mice don't have the lips and the tongue and they can't make speech sounds. Okay. But they, if you record it and then slow it down, or lower the frequency so we can hear it. it kind of sounds like a bird. Okay. Um, so the question is, uh, it's not a model for human speech, but it could be, it could mice be a model for the voluntary control of vocalization? Because that's really what the problem in human stuttering is. People, People who stutter, they don't have problems making words. Their, their grammar, their pronunciation, all their, their memory is all fine. They just can't do it the way they want to do it. Okay, so could mice work for that? Next slide. Answer is, oh yeah. So you can put the mice, here's the mutation in that big stuttering family from Pakistan. We took that muta causative mutation, the individual mutation, and we put it into a mouse and Here's that guy, one of those little guys. and He has an identifying tattoo on his tail. But other than that, he's a perfectly fine little mouse. There's, we tested these mice for everything. We tested them on the run, on the treadmill and the nose poke. We tested them for memory. We tested them how fast they could run on a treadmill. We, they're fine. They breed normally. They, they do everything normally. 
They even vocalize a lot, but not quite perfectly. So next slide, please. Um, these animals are born in normal numbers with the expected distribution of sex and genotype. They grow and reproduce normally, normal behavior on a wide variety of measures. Much about their vocalizations is normal. However, next slide. Oh, yeah, I had to take this one. Up. However, they vocalize, they have a problem in their vocalization. They have gaps. Instead of chirp, 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 it's chirp, chirp. Chirp, 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 chirp. Um, and in fact, so this, we figured that out. There's no human observer that does this. So Tara Barnes, who I'll acknowledge at the end, uh, wrote an automated acoustical analysis program that just has a computer analyze all the sounds that's coming out of these little mice. And she found this problem. And then she took the speech of the humans who had the same mutation. And she just had the computer program analyze their speech, and it had this exact same problem. Okay, so uh, then, so you got a mouse who kind of stutters, sort of. Um, what's wrong with the mouse? Okay, and this is my one science slide. I apologize. I thought maybe people would want to see a little science. Ignore everything on this slide except right here. So uh, I had a postdoc, an incredibly talented guy, uh, Taeyun Han. Is his name here? Anyway, Taeyun, I said to Taeyun, we did, we sent him to a pathologist and pathologists look at tissue to see if they can find a problem. When you get a tumor, it goes to the pathologist and they look at it through the microscope and they tell you what cell it is and how cancerous it is, right? We sent it to a pathologist who's used to looking at mouse tissues, a, a really talented guy. He said, there's nothing wrong with this mouse. I said, well, we know there's one little thing wrong. He couldn't find it. So my postdoc, Taeyun Han, Dr. Han, said, I think I can do better. So he started taking stains for different cell types in the brain. And we don't even know how many different cell types are in the human brain. People think there might be a couple hundred. That's where we are. But that's okay. He was undaunted. I'm just going to start staining, and we're going to see if we find anything. And he just took stain after stain after stain, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then one day, <laughs> anti, an antibody stain, anti-glial fibrillary acidic protein, anti-GFAT, it stains a particular cell type, one and only one cell type in the brain, a cell called astrocytes. And uh, the reason these cells, uh, and that's the green stain. So here's the normal mouse. It has a normal gene on one chromosome and the, uh, one of its chromosome 12s, and this is the normal gene on the other. And you see it's got all this green in this particular place in the brain. And here is the animal that has the mutation in the mutation, just like the people in the Pakistani family. And you see there's not very much green. Uh, and this is young mice, and this is middle-aged mice. And you see it's even more pronounced. And this is the data showing you that it really is less green in the animal. So these animals have something wrong with this cell type. They're, they're, when people were first discovering cells in the brain, they thought this type of cell looked like a star. So they called it an astrocyte. They're sort of star-shaped cells. So there's something wrong with the astrocytes in these mice. Okay, all right, next slide, please. And so we put these mice in a scanner. People have done MRI scans of stutterers for decades. Okay, and they find differences usually up here in the areas that we know are associated with speech. The problem with imaging studies, the brain is very plastic. It can remodel itself. If it has a stroke or something like that, or learning, the brain can remodel. So you can't tell whether the differences you see on an MRI of a human who stutters is the cause of stuttering or the result of stuttering. That's the problem with imaging studies. Aside, the other problem is they can't see anything nearly the size of a cell. They can, see, they can see something about one millimeter by one millimeter. And that's, that's it's got to go 100 times smaller to see a cell. Okay, so we took these brains. Oh yeah, we put them in a 14 Tesla scanner. So if you get an MRI, et cetera, wherever you get your MRIs, they're gonna, they will now have a pretty powerful machine that in terms of its magnetic field is three Tesla. That's pretty good. Research uses, they put humans for some special purposes in a seven Tesla scanner. 
uh, it makes humans very dizzy. So it's, they, you probably can't use field strengths, fields that high. You can't use an MRI that powerful. This is 14 Tesla. <laughs> we used to joke that you could levitate the mouse brain. <laughs> um, any case, we did find a difference. Um, we, we, we did these big scans with this super powerful scanner. Uh, and then the people who looked at the scans, read the MRIs, didn't know which mice were the mutant mice and which mice were the genetically normal brothers and sisters. Okay, all right. Uh, and we found something um, in the... In, in a part of the brain, a huge connection, a big thing called the corpus callosum, the large body, corpus callosum. Um, and here, here's, a, here's an old drawing. It's as if you pulled the hemisphere of the brain back to kind of look underneath. Here's the corpus callosum. It's this huge cable that connects the right half from the left half. And this is looking down from the top. Uh, if you look from the front, if you just took a looking straight on from the front, here's the corpus callosum. But there's another big connection between the two halves, and it's called the anterior commissure, this thing. So these little mice had problems in their corpus callosum and in their anterior commissure. Okay, that's where the problems were. We didn't find anything anywhere else. Next slide. So where did that leave us? Well, it turns out we found another family. Uh, this one again is inbred, and we found a mutation on chromosome three. And it turns out, another Pakistani stuttering family. And it turns out the mutation that causes stuttering in this family is a gene called ZBTB20. Um, ZBTB20 does not move things around inside the cell. It does something completely different. Um, ZBTB20 is, uh, it's called a transcription factor. What's a transcription factor? Every cell in the body has 20, the same 21,000 genes, every cell, all right? So why is a liver cell so different than a bone cell? so different than a skin cell. Well, it's which of those 21,000 genes are turned on and which are turned off, okay? And what does the turning on and the turning off? Transcription factors, okay? So um, this thing uh, turns genes on and off, okay? The question is, um, what, I mean, there's hundreds of transcription factors responsible for skin cell development or or your, the, your eye or uh, your toenails. <laughs> they all have their own transcription factors that are doing the turning on and turning off, okay, that can make them what they are. Next slide. So what are they? ZBTB20 promotes astrocytogenesis, the, the, the production of astrocytes in the developing mouse brain, okay? So, uh, Wow, <laughs> this is beginning again, deja vu all over again. Um, and in the meantime, these people were doing better brain scans of humans who stutter, especially little kids who stutter. It's hard to scan little kids because you got to sit still in the scanner. Um, but they used a, a higher resolution scanner that could look deeper. I mean, Broca's area is up here in the, it's in the, it's in what you can see, it's in the cortex of the brain, but they looked down beneath that. And where did they find problems? In something called the corpus callosum in the brains of kids who stutter. Next slide. So where does this all get us after, I should just tell you after 23 years. <laughs> um, so here, are, here is our list, our, our great list of the seven, the seven popular hypotheses. Next slide, please. And it really everything we have found supports this one and none of it supports anything else, really. So um, this has really kind of changed the view of what causes this disorder. Um, I, would, I, I didn't have the time to talk about um, using this information about moving things around inside cells to develop drugs, but people are working on that because as I said, moving things around inside cells causes lots of neurologic disorders and many of which are very common, very devastating neurologic disorders. And so there's a strong reason for the pharmaceutical industry to be interested in those things. Um, and we're thinking maybe a rising tide floats all boats. Maybe something discovered for Parkinson's disease will actually use the same mechanism that we're now finding in stuttering. Um, but it's clear that, um, that it, this would explain a lot 
of what was so puzzling about this disorder. Um, people who stutter are perfectly athletic. Um, uh, Bill Walton, uh, everybody here can probably remember Bill Walton, most, M, uh, NBA's most valuable player uh, for the Portland Trailblazers back in the 80s. Um, Bill Walton has a very severe stutter, and yet he's the NBA's most valuable player, right? I mean, it's, it does, stuttering does not affect other parts of the body. These people um, are perfectly high functioning. Uh, Moses, Moses, a uh, high functioning guy, if there ever was one. Uh, Moses had a very severe stutter, so bad, in fact, that he, when he went to the Pharaoh to say, let my people go, uh, he had to have his brother Aaron do the talking because he just couldn't, you know, in front of the Pharaoh, anxiety producing, he just couldn't get it out. So uh, lots of high functioning people uh, stutter and there is nothing else wrong with them. They go to college at the same frequency as everybody else. They're just as athletic as everybody else. They don't, it's not a psychiatric disease. These people do not have psychiatric disorders. And in general, psychiatric drugs don't work on stuttering. They just, they just don't. Um, and now we can see why, because if it's, if it's a problem of communicating between the two sides of your brain, well, that's not, that's not a psychiatric disorder. That's a, what we call a systems disorder. So anyway, um, if I could have the next slide. Yeah, conclusions. The complex genetics of stuttering can be overcome in at least some cases by studying unusual families with structures and mating patterns not found um, in North America and Europe where most biomedical research gets done. Uh, the genes found in these specialized populations uh, carry other mutations that cause stuttering in everywhere else in the world. Next slide. Um, we found five genes so far. There are more, perhaps many more, that remain to be identified. There are more genes. We, the heritability is 85%, and we can find, with the genes we found so far, we find a mutation in maybe 20 or 25% of people who stutter. So we got a long way to go. Early results show a previously unsuspected cellular deficit, uh, these type of brain cells called astrocytes. Uh, putting human stuttering mutations into mice results in vocalization deficits similar to those found in the humans that these mutations originally came from. Okay, so we recreated the human disorder in a mouse by changing one letter of the genetic code out of 3 billion in the DNA in mice takes that mice from a normally vocalizing mouse to a problem vocalizing mouse. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, it appears like modest deficits in the ability to move molecules around inside cells appear to be preferentially, uh, they appear to be expressed in this cell type called astrocytes. Um, Another stuttering mutation, ZBTB20, appears to cause a problem in the development of astrocytes in the brain. Uh, astrocyte deficits and stuttering appear to be especially prominent in the parts of the brain that connect the left and right hemispheres. And connections between the brain hemispheres is a recurrent theme in our genetic findings. So if I could have the next slide, please. Yeah, uh, I have breezed through uh, 23 years of work done by some amazingly talented people. Only a small number are listed here, but I think just by having a look at, at the institutional affiliations of some of these places, you can see what a, a broad ranging project this was. Uh, and it couldn't have been done without people, many, many people who have lots of skills that Lord knows I certainly don't have. Um, so, um, and finally, um, None of this could have been done if we didn't have research volunteers. Uh, the, the people in the stuttering community have been extremely helpful and generous with their time um, to participate in these research studies that really are the foundation of everything we did. So with that, I'll, uh, next slide, please. I'll close, thank you for your attention and take any and all questions. We will take questions here. Um, we'll go back and forth. And I see we have a couple hands up. <clears throat> Let's start right. I don't know if this is uh, if it's possible to answer this quickly, but what do, what is meant by the sequencing of genes? I right. hear and read that a lot. Right. Sequencing. 
R right. So the question is, what is meant by the sequencing of genes? Uh, this is a very good question. So DNA is, um, the genetic information resides in a molecule that's in our chromosomes. That's the part where you can see just looking through a microscope. DNA is too small to see in a microscope. It's a very long twisted molecule and it consists of letters of instruction. Uh, and uh, each letter, um, the, it's red, um, three letters at a time. So T, 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 it's just, it only, there's only four letters to DNA. That's why people didn't think DNA could possibly be the genetic material. It was too simple. It, it, it only had four different components. It had A, T, G, and C. T, T, T encodes one of the amino acids, phenylalanine. Um, so um, Marshall Nirenberg at the NIH won the Nobel Prize because that was the first cracking of the genetic codes. Anyway, um, so when you sequence the DNA, you, you actually read the sequence of the letters and you can then tell what they code for and then you know what that gene does. Okay, next. Um, sort of related to that, when you started your talk, you talked about looking at genes and then you noticed a mutation. What does that look like compared to a gene that doesn't have a mutation? Right. Uh, that's a person after my own heart, uh, the technology. Uh, so what it looks like, um, it now looks, because of the technology has evolved, it now looks quite different than the way it looked when we found it. Um, the technology used um, to, to sequence the human genome, um, uh, the way it looks is you, you, you take the sample of DNA, the piece of DNA that you want to determine the sequence of, and you do a bunch of stuff to it, and we can talk about that if you want, uh, and then you load it on a machine and it separates, uh, you, you break it up into fragments, okay, of each differs from each other by one letter of the genetic code, okay? You've got this one, and then the next one up is one letter longer, and the next one up is one more letter longer, and then three letters longer, four letters longer. And those, and each step of the ladder, what, what's the letter? Is it A, T, G, or C? Those are four different colors. It's either going to be yellow, green, red, or blue. Uh, the, this was all done by Applied Biosystems in Foster City down on the peninsula. So that's where, and it was the technology used to sequence the whole human genome, three billion bases. Um, so what you're looking at is you're looking at a readout of something as it comes by the detector window. So it's yellow, yellow, green, blue, yellow, green, red, blue, yellow, yellow. And that, that is what it looks like is you'll see a peak come by of a different color. So uh, did that answer the question? Aha, because one of them was yellow, yellow, green, blue, red, yellow, green. And another one was yellow, 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 blue, red. <laughs> it's like, oops, that one's not right. And of course, by that time, we had the sequence of the whole human genome. So you could just go in there and look and say, what is it supposed to be? It's supposed to be A. It's not A, it's T. You didn't talk about cures or mitigating help. Right. About 10, 12 years ago, they did a movie about uh, Queen Elizabeth's dad, uh, is that George, I think it was? The King's something or the Tudor. And when he was able to address the nation without any stammer at all, what, what did the learning skills overcome the DNA skills? Right. So most treatment for, for stuttering, so, this is the King's speech. Uh, Colin Firth was the star. Uh, I'll, I'll just a little, I'm sorry, a little hint. The, I told you I work for the Stuttering Foundation. The president of the Stuttering Foundation is a woman, extremely able woman, Jane Fraser. She's kind of our age, okay, Jane. Uh, the foundation, uh, Jane, a very prominent person. Uh, Jane went over for the, the opening of the movie because the, the opening was in London, actually. And she got to meet Colin Firth and she said she just melted because <laughs> he was so handsome. <laughs> anyway, so the, most stuttering therapy treatments involve sort of training the brains of people uh, to, to kind of get around it. Uh, and they also involve reducing the anxiety because many times a person who stutters, you put them up and it's like, 
oh, crushing anxiety in this stuttering just is terrible. Um, so here's the problem with stuttering therapy. There are many, many different types, many different strategies therapists use. All of them were developed by great leaders in the field of speech language pathology. Many of them are very different from each other. Uh, some, some therapy methods teach you to speak slower, slow your speech. Others teach people to speak faster. Um, just try and get through it. Um, it turns out nobody knows why some of these work and why they don't work. Uh, just two facts about speech therapy. Number one, it's um, not as good as we would like. About one third of people who come for speech therapy get long lasting benefit. About one third get temporary benefit. They'll, it'll be fine for a while and then they'll just go back to stuttering. Uh, one third never see any benefit at all. So therapies for stuttering are not where we would like them to be. Um, I have a personal opinion. I don't, I wouldn't stand up in front of an audience of speech language pathologists and say this, but the one thing all stuttering therapies have in common is they distract you from what you're saying. They make you think about something else while you talk. And that works. It's, it's very interesting. Stuttering is a disorder where if you don't think about your speech, you're, it gets better. It's, there's another very rare disorder of speech called cluttering in which people talk too fast. They talk so fast that they begin to jumble their words. It's cluttering. If you tell people to, to uh, pay more attention exactly, pay intense attention to what they're saying, cluttering will get better. Stuttering is just the opposite. Don't pay attention to what you're saying. Think of something else. Um, so um, personally, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry. I worked for a, a company a long time um, down on the peninsula called Genentech. Uh, so I sort of think about the pharmaceutical model um, and the pharmaceutical model is a pill. And for a pill, you need a target. Um, and whether the target is gonna be one of these genes or some related gene in trafficking, we don't know yet. Uh, it, sort of following up on this uh, last one in regard to King George, uh, you mentioned the familial uh, relationships in stuttering. Was there any in the royal family or was he a unique? He, he was a unique. About, about half of people who come to stuttering therapy report a family history and the other half don't. Now, Maybe there was family history and it was forgotten. It used to be embarrassing and people wouldn't talk about it. If you ask, so our two boys both stuttered. They're twins. They're now in their mid thirties. If you, they don't even remember, they were three years old. They don't remember. So as far as they're concerned, they never stuttered, right? So, but in general, there was no family history there. I have uh, two questions. What is the relationship between DNA and these genes? And secondly, there are thousands of these molecules in the cell and thousands of cell in the body. They're chemicals. They can easily, the, the energy difference between one state and another is very small. How is it that you look at one or a few cells and you say that's the way it is in the whole body? How confident are you of that? Right. So uh, this, this was like, this was the essence of my undergraduate education right here. <laughs> um, yes, the energy state between them is actually not that high compared to real chemistry, but a lot of biochemical processes are, are it's weak interactions rule biochemistry, just as a general rule. The things, but that's another issue. Um, Okay, so the relationship between DNA and a gene is as follows. Um, genes are composed of DNA. The gene is a, concept, is a concept, it's a, it's a conceptual thing. A gene is something that controls a trait, okay? Uh, and that trait could be your hair color, it could be how tall you are, it could be uh, whether or not you bleed <laughs> um, uncontrollably. Um, so, um, 
genes are made of DNA, um, and the, the way they work is that uh, genes are, um, they have a, a distinctive start. Uh, genes, I should tell you, I mean, not to make life difficult for everybody here, um, 21,000 genes in the human genome, there's 3 billion letters of, of DNA, only 1.5% of the DNA in each cell actually codes for something that we can recognize as a gene product. The rest seems to be the raw material for evolution. Now about another couple percent is preserved very far apart across the time. I mean, another 3% of the DNA is preserved is the same between humans and mice and they're 65 million years apart in evolution. So they must have some function we don't know what it is yet in most cases. So um, the, the, the short answer to the first question is uh, DNA is what genes are made of, okay? And it's read three letters at a time. And each letter, each three letters make codes for one amino acid in a protein. And proteins form the structures and functions of the body. So cartilage is the what makes the inside of your nose. Uh, alpha crystalline is what makes the lens of your eye, different proteins do different functions in the body. They're either structural or they run they're enzymes. They run all the chemical reactions that keep us going. Okay, so the other one is how can you be sure it's just one thing? Right. Um, like I tell people, genetics is for biologists who like numbers. <laughs> um, the much, much genetic evidence is statistical inference, it's statistical in nature. It's you see something more often in people who have the disorder than in people who don't have the disorder, that that couldn't have happened by chance. It's just, it's, it's just statistically impossible. But the ultimate proof that that is the cause is something like we did with our mouse. You can change, you can take the one difference that you can find in the effect of the people who are affected with the disorder that is not in the people who are normal, right? In the same family, you can put that difference into a mouse and now all of a sudden the mouse expresses the disorder after changing one letter. It's, it's quite remarkable, but, it, but that's considered the ultimate proof. Follow on question? Go ahead. Molecules in the body and you're mm -hmm. changing a few and that changes the no, no. whole system of the body? I don't understand. No, no, every cell in the body has the mutation found in PKST72. Every cell in the body contains that mutation. It, so why is it just stuttering? Why don't they have, why doesn't their liver have a problem? Why don't their bones have a problem, right? And the answer is usually it's what cells need that the most. They're the first ones to show the problem. And that's the way it is with a lot of pathology. It's the, it's whatever, you can look at what gets, as I say, transcription factors say, determine what are those genes are turned on and what are turned off. So you can look at the so-called expression levels of different genes. And there's a huge world of biomedical research that just does this. And what you'll find is the most highly expressed genes in a particular cell, that's the tissue that gets the disease when there's a mutation in that gene. That's the one who gets it first because it's, it, so that's, so there's, um, there's one set of molecule, one set of DNA, one set of copy of our DNA in every cell in our body, except red blood cells. Red blood cells don't have any DNA. Um, but in all other cells, they've all got the same DNA. And um, the reason only some cells in one organ of the body or the other express a disease is because they probably need that more than any other organ in the body. That's usually the way it works. Right, you you do it in the you do it in the egg, you do it in the ovum, and then you fertilize it and you implant that in the mouse and it divides and divides and divides and divides and divides and makes a whole new little mouse in every cell in its body. Actually, I talked at the Futures Club. There's a new technology that Jennifer Doudna at Berkeley and others won the Nobel Prize for. Uh, 
three years ago called CRISPR-Cas. And there you can actually just go in and change the cell. You don't have to change every cell in the body. So the future is coming when you don't have to do it in every cell in the body. But that's right now they can, yeah, the, but that's a future thing. You mentioned astrocytes as being the target of some of these things. I thought astrocytes were kind of helper nerve cells outside. Oh. Oh. He, said, he said, I thought astrocytes were sort of helper cells in the brain. Excuse me, who planted this guy? <laughs> Somebody who knows their neuroscience. Yes, astrocytes, I, I had a bet. Actually, I had a couple of bets on what cell type was going to be amiss in stuttering, and I lost miserably. Astrocytes, are, they're not neurons. They're not electrically active. They're not involved in processing information as it flows in and comes back out of the brain. Um, and so I thought, doesn't it seem like that's where the deficit would be in stuttering? It would be some sort of neuronal problem because these are the neurons that, you know, are for speech, right? And it's like, yeah. <laughs> no, astrocytes are helper cells. Um, and now we're getting into speculation a little bit. All we know, right, is kind of what I showed here. Um, the demands for help. So neurons are very specialized function. And so they have these helper cells. They're, so, they're called glia, uh, the German word for glue. Um, there's, so there's neurons and there's glia. Um, and glia have thought of them as being supporting actors, you know, in the business. Um, so it turns out that probably in these big white matter track, these big connections, these big cables between large parts of the brain at some distance from each other, like our two hemispheres, those big, those big cables, they need a lot of help. They're far away from cell bodies. Um, and so they need a lot of astrocytes to keep them happy and healthy and going. And so when they don't have help from the astrocytes, then um, they've got a problem. The neurons have a problem. That's the current theory. But it's a very good point. Uh, if I was still working at the NIH, I'd be working on this. Can I ask you to take a look longitudinally? You said that uh, there were, that you said that there were, were people who got better over time with this stuttering problem. Now, do they have the same genetic format 20 years later, like your twins, or has it changed? And if it's changed, why and how? Right, so the genetics don't change. Our body has lots of mechanisms to make sure our DNA is sacrosanct and does it, it, it corrects environmental mutagens, it does all sorts of things. Our DNA is very well taken care of. It doesn't change. It's the reference copy of genetic information. A, a related molecule called RNA, if you've had a COVID vaccine, that, that genetic material in that vaccine is RNA. It's not DNA. Uh, RNA is the working copy. Okay, so the reference copy, the library is the DNA, the working copy is the RNA. Uh, so it doesn't change DNA and their DNA doesn't change. The people who, the people who um, don't recover tend to be the people who have mutations we can find, mutations with big effects. The people who do recover, some of them probably have mutations. A lot of them probably have mutations, but we haven't found those genes yet because they're, they exert smaller effects. And, and hence, the disorder is less severe. They recover, they get over it. So that probably is, it, there probably is some genetic influence on persistence versus recovery in stuttering. Um, in fact, there is, but um, we, we really don't know what that is. But the DNA, their DNA is not changing. It's the ability of their, of their brain to, to construct a workaround probably what's changing. The, 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 the classic example of this, stuttering is mostly, persistent stuttering is mostly a boy's problem. Boys and girls onset is almost equal between the two gen genders. It's about 1.4 to one male, uh, uh, males to females. But 
at the age of 10 or 15, after any recover, most recovery takes place in late childhood, adolescence. At the age of 20, stuttering is like 85%, 80 to 85% males. It's a male problem. And as a, the general, and that's the same with many neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, autism is like that. Um, lots of problems are like that. The girls get over it better. It's probably because their brains are a little more plastic. Uh, but of course, that is, that's covering up a lot of unknown science with sort of a blanket sort of statement. But in general, as general rule, the female brain is a little bit better at it's a little bit more plastic, and it seems to be able to find workarounds better than the boys' brains. We have any other questions? Yes. Any questions I understand by any chance? I have we, one. <laughs> so I think with some genetic disorders now, there has been success in reversing the disorder with stem cell infusions. Absolutely. Is that... Mm -hmm. Has and that been tried with stuttering? No, it hasn't. And the reason why is, uh, so yes, uh, stem cell therapies are beginning to take off. Um, they're very tissue specific. They tend to work with things like uh, blood disorders because the blood is manufactured in the bone marrow and you can do a bone marrow transplant. You can ablate, you can just get rid of a person's native bone marrow. Uh, they will obviously die <laughs> if you don't fix it quick and you just transplant in. So what they do now is they draw out your bone marrow and they take the white blood cells and, and put them in a dish and they put fixative genes. They put good copies of the gene in there and then they grow them up to big amounts. I mean, a whole bag full of them. And then they kill your bone marrow, let it just die. It's very, it's very toxic, nasty business. And then they just put your fixed white blood cells in and they go and they repopulate your bone marrow. And ta-da, you, you don't have that genetic disease anymore. Now, the mutation is still in there. It's still in all the other cells in your body. It just doesn't seem to make any difference there because that gene is turned off in other tissues in the body and doesn't, you don't care. But um, so yes, the short answer is people are doing gene therapy uh, for some tissue types. Um, and there's a new, even newer thing coming, which is um, actually putting the corrective gene, a good copy of the gene um, in a virus, in an otherwise kind of harmless virus called adeno-associated virus. Uh, adenovirus is a, first uh, isolated from your adenoids, okay? It causes common colds, okay? Uh, there are bunch of different kinds. They're, they're not very serious viruses. Um, but one of them, weird little virus, just kind of tags along with adenovirus. It can't even grow by itself. It only grows when the cell is infected with a real adenovirus. But this thing's around, and it's, it's a harmless virus, but it infects human cells um, promiscuously. It'll infect any human cell, pretty much, as far as we can tell. Um, and you can put a corrective gene in that, they're a little virus, so they don't have much room. It has to be kind of a small gene to do it. You can't put, you know, can't cure hemophilia because that's a huge gene. You can't cure muscular dystrophy. Those are really big genes. But little genes, things like metabolic disorders, you can put in the corrective gene in nano associated virus, and then it's usually infected into, into the liver or someplace like that, and they'll spread. And it works. Um, there was a very nasty and unfortunate incident um, at Johns Hopkins where there was a young man, Jesse Gelsinger was his name. He was healthy. Eight, he had a genetic disease and it was, it was annoying. And he was occasionally hospitalized for it, but it wasn't going to get any better. And so they offered to try and fix it with adeno associated virus and they did. And he promptly died. And that set gene therapy, especially adeno-associated virus gene therapy, back 15 years. Uh, but um, it's the safety issues with it are have been figured out and addressed, uh, and it's kind of coming back. So people are talking about using that gene therapy to fix all sorts of things now, not just blood disorders, which you can fix by bone marrow transplantation, but all sorts of things. The general problem is anything in the brain. The brain is a very protected place. Uh, it's hard to get things into the brain. 
uh, once they're in there, they don't know enough about the brain. They don't know about all the different cell types in the brain. They're still very cautious about doing gene therapy straight into the brain. It's just, yeah. Um, human subject safety committees aren't going to approve that sort of thing now. They're just, it's just not going to happen yet because they don't know enough. Uh, it's a little too worrisome. They'll, they'll work on the more doable things first. Yeah. Anything what else? a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I Thank didn't you. know we had such an intelligent crowd too. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I hope